And I know that uh, it's been a long day and hopefully a very enjoyable day for everyone. Uh, I think we've got a great session coming up with, with Cathy uh, just shortly. Uh, we spoke about a month ago and um, I was... I was out cycling with one of my friends and said, I need to get back. I've got a call with Cathy Moore to talk about Learning Technologies Conference. And, uh, and my friend was really impressed. He said, you know, Cathy's been one of the key people in terms of my development as an L&D professional. Um, and he said, it's stuff that I use every day um, from my time with the bank to, to being self-employed now. So, um, yeah. And then uh, Donald uh, sent me through the the descriptor of the, the session that Cathy was going to run. And I was intrigued by mind tricks for learn, um, Jedi mind tricks for learning designers. Um, and the only thing that would have intrigued me more was Jedi mind tricks for parents of a 16-year-old boy. Um, anyway, so it is my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce Cathy Moore as uh, the speaker for this afternoon. Thank you, Kenny. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. As you can see, we're going to talk about mind tricks, Jedi mind tricks, for learning designers. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about beliefs that are common in our profession that limit what we can do and the quality of what we can do. And then we'll talk about the tricks we can use to counteract those beliefs, either among our clients, also with our colleagues and also in our own heads. We're going to focus on the client, but it actually applies to everybody that we need to deal with. And just a quick question for my understanding. How many of you primarily work with internal clients? Other people in your organization come to you. And how many primarily with external clients? OK. It applies to both, but it's good for me to know. Whatever type of client you have, this is probably how it starts. At least this is often how it starts. And if you're a conventional instructional designer like I was for years, this is how it ends. I have a question for you. What are the side effects of a traditional information dump? And I'm going to be asking you questions throughout, and hopefully we can hear you. And if not, I will repeat it. So what are the side effects of this? Any, any suggestions? Boredom. <laughs> More training. <laughs> Loss of faith. I'm sorry? A deadline shift because you can't get through it. <laughs> what else? What are the other effects of an information dump on, for example, our leaders? We've talked about how the learners are bored. We are probably bored making this thing. What about the leaders? What do they think? Do they, are we impressing them with how useful we are? No, we are not. These slides are kind of washed out. But what it says, <laughs> if L&D were eliminated, performance wouldn't change. The people who said this were leading people in corporations interviewed recently. More than half of them said they could eliminate their L&D departments and nothing would change. As an L&D person and an optimist, I look at that gray half and I say, ooh, but almost half think that we are indeed somewhat useful. <laughs> However, separate survey, so this isn't the same people, but in a separate survey, 25% managed to say that L&D is actually critical to business outcomes. So we're going to look at how we can combat limiting beliefs to not only make our leaders realize how very useful we can be, but also for a selfish reason. I want us to love what we do and know that it matters. And if your work as a training designer sometimes leaves you a little unfulfilled, maybe some of what you pick up today will help turn that around. So let's dissect a little bit more what happens when the client comes and says they need training. First of all, in conventional instructional design, I'm including instructional designers in this, how do we define they? Usually it's this. They are people with problematically empty heads. Need, how do we determine need? We make assumptions. 
Sales are low, the salespeople need training. They're filling out false performance reports, they need ethics training, they must be told that it is wrong to lie. Morale is low, clearly it's the manager's fault and they need training. New software is coming. Everyone must be trained because no adult on earth has ever figured out how to use a new program without formal training. And can I ask, um, there's a lot of gray and shading that's missing from the slides as they're being projected. <laughs> okay, it'll be an issue later. Let's, let's see what happens. And training, how is that often defined? <laughs> Online or live, presented at a specific date and time, done once, we are done. Why is this so common? Because so many of us, the vast majority, had this experience of learning. We think that this is learning, this is teaching, training is teaching, therefore training does this. We come from the world of telling and then testing. And maybe this is somewhat useful if the people that are being told are eight years old and an eight-year-old doesn't know who Genghis Khan was, so of course we have to tell them and then we test them to see that they know it. But our learners aren't eight years old. They have decades of experience doing possibly what we are supposed to teach them how to do and they're doing it in this complex environment. They just want to get their job done. They don't want to take a test. They're dealing with outdated processes, clumsy tools, unhelpful managers. But in the conventional approach, we are so hyper-focused. We start off right away. He has to know this thing because his head is, of course, empty. If we're focusing on what he has to know, we must be focusing on that because his head is empty. And his world just vanishes. We are no longer even noticing the context in which he allegedly needs to know this thing. And instead, we need to talk about what does he need to do and how can we help him do it. The problem is that our client isn't seeing it this way. Our client is still stuck on. They need training, and training is installing information into heads. We need to get out of this mindset and a lot of people agree. I've heard a lot of talks actually today and in other conferences, but why are we not doing it? One reason is the people that prepare us for our jobs say things like this. And if you can't read it, please raise your hand. Instructional design is instructional design is instructional design. It sounds like poetry. People think K-12 must be so different from corporate, but teaching six-year-olds and adults is not that different. This is someone in charge of preparing new instructional designers for their jobs. In 15 minutes of poking around on the internet, I found these quotes explaining what instructional design is and what's important in it. The most important measure is the knowledge assessment. Our focus should be on knowledge acquisition, knowledge deepening, and knowledge creation. You see a theme? The learner should be given an assessment immediately after completing each learning objective. Analysis refers to gathering information about the audience and tasks so the content will be more useful. Content should be divided into facts, concepts, and all those other categories that you may have learned. It's all about the content. And earlier today, I walked around in the exhibit, and I kept careful scientific tally of how many times the word content came up in all of those displays of all the booths, and it was about 9.2 bajillion times, <laughs> more or less, because it's all about content. And when we combine all this, we get job descriptions like this. We are to write clear and engaging content. We tailor the voice for the audience we visualize compelling ways to present instructional information. We present content to a passive audience. So it's no surprise that our client views us as presenting content to a passive audience because that is how so much of our profession is defined. She's still stuck in the school world. I have no idea what slide is next. Let's find out. Yes. <laughs> 
I'm not saying that knowledge doesn't matter. Some people are saying that I do. I'm not saying this. I'm saying that knowledge is actually extremely important. And if we want people to make good decisions, they have to have accurate knowledge. What I am saying is that we should not start with an obsession about their heads. We should not start with an assumption that there is a knowledge problem. That comes much later. We want to move from this, they need training when we're defining training as knowledge installation into brains, to this. Because that's what we need to get the client to talk about. And that's what we're going to look at here. And we're going to do it with an example. So imagine that aliens have landed on Earth. They can't get back to their home planet. They can sort of deal with life on Earth. And friendly Earthlings, since we are so friendly, are incorporating them into our families. So government institutions will assign you an alien if you would like to have one in your family. Aliens, being aliens, have some special needs. So if you have an alien family member, sometimes you need to take more time off of work. So of course, we now have alien leave policies. And of course, they must be trained on them. Our managers must be trained on the alien leave policy. Traditional approach. Even if you can't read it, it doesn't matter. You know what it says. <laughs> we have a welcome that says you're going to understand things, identify things, explain things, define things. We present the policy because we can't, they can't read it or something. So we chunk it down. We put it in bullet points on a slide. And then because we have presented important information that they must know, we test them on that information. In which of the following instances is an employee entitled to alien leave? Blah, blah, blah. We make a choice. What type of memory? Easy question. What type of memory are we testing? What am I hearing? <laughs> Short term. We're, we're testing their lizard brain. Can you recognize something that you read on a slide about five seconds ago? I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, I didn't change the page number. We have a person who sees detail. <laughs> That's great. Here's the feedback we get. Correct. Blah, blah, blah. How much processing is happening with this kind of feedback? How much, how much churning is going on in the brain? <laughs> it's hitting the next button. As much, as much fine motor control as we need <laughs> to hit the next button, it's not getting in. And some people would say, including some vendors, not to trash vendors, some people would say, yeah, maybe this is short-term memory, but we can keep repeating this information. Every week, we can send them a quiz question about the alien leave policy to make sure they still know this. There's a bigger question here. Do they have to know the alien leave policy? What do they really need to do? They need to read it and apply it. Apply it. They do not need to memorize the alien leave policy. So why are we doing this? We're doing this because this is what we always do. Here's an alternative. I'll give you a chance to read it. This alternative is also e-learning, so it's easier to compare. I'm not saying e-learning is always the best answer. But this is what could result if we actually stopped that information dump train took a step back and said, what do the managers need to do with the alien leave policy? They can read it. They're adults. The policy is understandable enough. We talk to the subject matter experts. We analyze what is challenging about being a manager in a company with alien leave. And we have come up with several challenges that represent the main mistakes or challenges that, may, that managers are facing. So we don't present the policy at all. We say, you are an adult. The policy is here for you to read. Let's just plunge you into a decision. Having read this, <laughs> there's a button in the corner. It says alien leave policy. You can read this thing and make your decision without looking at the policy. I'm not being your parents saying, you must read this policy. 
like any manager on the job. You have the time to read the policy. This is not an emergency. Or you can make a decision based on your current understanding of the policy. What, with this kind of question, is happening in people's brains? How much processing and what type of processing? What learny things do we want to have happen that are happening? Any, any ideas? What, what's happening with their pre-existing knowledge? You're applying it in a specific context. Are you rummaging around to see what you already know? You're calling on pre-existing knowledge? You are perhaps noticing your own gaps, saying, uh, I'm not so sure about this. Or you're letting things you've heard pull you in the wrong direction. You are also maybe fighting your own internal opinions about aliens and whether they should even really be allowed to stay here. And what about all those do-gooders who are always having them come into their family? I mean, there's any number of things that we have learned about through analysis that we have fed into this story. So people are rummaging around in their brains. They say, you know, it sounds like we could give Jorge alien leave for the day, but ask him to call in for the meeting. It's a good compromise. He'll be home for the kid, but we won't you know, tick off the client. Here's the feedback. You screwed up. <laughs> That's always the HR lady that tells you. <laughs> Last time we had, we made a choice, we were told correct. We were told blatantly correct, confirming information, and we were just hitting that next button. What is happening at this point? What level of processing? How likely is this to be stored? Any, I can't hear. You're doing some reflection. You're doing some digesting. In this case, we are maybe a little surprised because we thought we knew what we were doing, and it turns out we were a little wrong. We are learning this in the context of a specific situation, a story. And according to Roger Shank and, and many others, if we learn something in the context of a story, that gives us a framework in which to store it. In that other course, when we were just learning random factoids about the alien leave policy, we were throwing them into the gray compliance bin in the back of our brain, something I might need to know for a compliance quiz. This is much more relevant. So uh, ideally, I'm, I can't say if this is proven by research, but I would like to think that there's a deeper level of processing, and we're also respecting the learner's intelligence and autonomy possibly making them feel more motivated. So we've gone from information dump with quiz to plunge them into an activity that has them, whoops, make decisions like the adults they are. And it's all comes from a different mindset. Information dump came from an information dump mindset. Our only goal is tell them everything they need to know, identify what they need to know, make a quiz question for every little bit of it. We're done. This one, we started with a measurable goal that's actually based on some improvement in performance of the organization. And this is where we get into being relevant to those leaders who think that we are not. So we identify whatever goal. In this case, it's probably reduced violations of the alien leave policy, kind of a compliancy goal. But it could be anything. We list what people need to do on the job to reach that goal, not what they need to know. So on this one item thing here that they might need to do is correctly offer alien leave in cases of foster kids coming home. <laughs> Very important step, often skipped. For each of these high priority behaviors, we ask what makes it hard to do, what makes it difficult. I actually have a flow chart and there's even a video on my blog that walks you through this. But essentially what we're asking is, what are the elements of the environment, such as tools that are not working, managers that are not supportive, some sort of cultural issue in the organization, maybe some prejudices on the part, you know, attitudinal things that are being supported by the culture. 
as well as ignorance, you know, a knowledge gap, skill gap, anything like that. With that analysis, we may find out that we just need, for example, one thing just needs a better job aid. We don't need training for everything. For the things that do need training, we brainstorm realistic practice activities like the one we just saw, representing the challenges that managers are having, the mistakes that they are making now. And then, only then, do we think about the information, and only then, it's the information essential for that activity. So we can say, they need to know not what exactly does the alien leave policy say word for word, but how do we apply it in this particular case? So that was the, the mindset. Let's look at the tricks. So how do we get the client from tell them everything about the alien leave policy to let's actually change what decisions people are making? First thing we need to do, it's all about the client. Our goal is to make the client look good. And if the client is wrong, they come to realize on their own that they were wrong. Our Outsider questions help them see for themselves that they need to change direction. And to be able to do that, we have to get in their heads. So where are they in the organization? Basic stuff like that. Which leads us to, are they feeling the pain of the problem, or are they just somebody's minion? Because we want to talk to the person who is actually suffering the pain of the problem. They're the only ones that really care about solving it, and they also have the in-depth understanding of it that we need. Whom do they need to please? Obviously, their boss, but they may also feel pressure from colleagues and the people that they're in charge of. And the big question, what will make them look good? They give us hints. Like if they say, everybody really liked that course with the talking poodle, you know kind of what they're hoping for. If they say, this issue is really messing up our, our abilities to meet our goals, it's making us look like slackers or whatever, you've got a better client, or at least one that's a little further along the road that you want them to be on. But you need to hear all of this and understand it so you know where they are and how you can help them meet that goal. And here's the big question that we always run into. What might prevent them from looking more closely at the problem? They are coming to us saying, make training for this thing. They may very much not be interested in talking more about the problem, and our job is to get them to talk about the problem so we can solve the real problem and not just dump information. So you all have been in this situation. Somebody says, make a course about X, and you suspect that that will not solve what the problem is. <laughs> so you say, hey, let's talk a little more about the problem, and they resist it in many ways. Common resistance, there is no time to do this sort of analysis. Just turn this information into a course. So one reason they might say this, there's a column saying possible cause. One possible cause may be there literally is no time because they've promised a solution like next week. But most often, there are other causes. What are some causes that might make somebody say this? What do you think? They don't want to know the truth. Life in the corporate world. They don't get rewarded for doing it. I'm sorry? They don't get rewarded for actually doing any of this. They don't get rewarded for actually solving the problem. Well, that's how we've always done it. It's the, it's the way we've always done it. Can't rock the boat. Can't change what we've always done. The cost is going to cost too much. I'm sorry? It's easier to delegate. At the session I went to earlier, there was a great quote from President Kennedy about how it's easier to just have opinions than to actually do difficult thinking. We're dodging a lot of responsibility. We're dodging the thought that needs to go into it. What else? They've been given an unrealistic deadline. How about something more murky and personal? Like, Important. They don't think it's important. They don't, know. they don't know how. How about if they might be part of the problem? They might be afraid about uh, what the analysis will, will say. They're afraid of what the analysis will show. 
I think um, a lot of the times when I've been on projects, it does seem to come down to that, whether it's a personal concern about, oh, I might look bad, or a concern about, this is gonna make everybody look at this big issue that everybody's pretending doesn't exist. And I don't wanna be the person that does that. So we've got, oh, and there's also that, I've promised to deliver a course. You know, I can't change what I promised to do. But yeah, the fear comes in. I don't want to rock the boat by pointing out big problems. Or if someone looks closely, they might decide that I am part of the problem. So we are imagining their resistance and planning our ways to dodge it. And we're gonna do it in two meetings. That first meeting, I'm calling it the handoff because that's traditionally what it's called and it's what the client is expecting to happen where they come to you and they say, turn this in, into a course, thank you, goodbye. We're gonna keep that meeting really short, but we're gonna um, get a little bit more out of the client and we're going to get them to agree to a kickoff meeting, to a longer meeting. I call it the action mapping kickoff, but it could be whatever type of analysis you use. You use this initial meeting to get a very high level glimpse of the problem. You schedule a longer meeting. Some people can only get an hour. I suggest you try at least for two hours. You can get a surprising amount done in a two hour focused discussion with the right people. And a the right way to do it would involve probably more people and more time. But I'm not saying create a whole board of directors and a committee and spend months on this because then we get you know, paralysis by analysis. So we're in the handoff meeting, getting the gist of things, doing some research on our own to prepare for the analysis meeting, the kickoff. So let's focus on the handoff. She's coming to you saying, this is, uh, they need training, turn this into a course. What response does she expect from you? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma Would you like fries with that? Sure, what type of course? When do you need it? How long should it be? What's your budget? These are the responses of the wor a worker in the course factory. You're totally commodified here. A product delivered at a specific time to specific measures. It's way too early to talk this way. And this is your first trick. <laughs> there is no course. There is no course. You have to convince yourself, the client, all your colleagues, there is no course. Nobody should be mentioning a course. And the client will be talking about a course. And as you'll see, you will not. You're going to be agreeable without agreeing. You're not gonna to agree to make a course. You're also not going to disagree because what happens if somebody says, I think I need this thing, and you say, no, you don't. <laughs> they need that thing even more <laughs> because now they, want, now they need to defend it and now they get attached to it. Get them to quickly clarify the problem so you can do a little research and prepare for the deeper analysis and also to make sure this is actually might be a training issue and get her to commit to that deeper analysis. And all this time, you're not talking about a course, you are talking about a problem. Some people like to use issue or challenge, softer words, whatever works in your organization or your part of the world, I like to use problem. So there's things that they say, and the things that you are programmed to say that you then must suppress and reprogram. She says, I need a course on X. I say, I'm happy to help. And then I don't say, when do you need it? I say, what kinds of problems have you been having with X? I'm a happy person here to help you. Tell me more about your problem. <laughs> People are doing Y and Z, which is wrong. Here's the content. So I'm gonna ask you guys what to say. Let's start out with how do we respond to the bit where she says, here's the content for the course. She has 187 PowerPoint slides that she lo lovingly created on Sunday afternoon thinking that they would help you. What do you say? I'm sorry? 
Do we say, what do they need to do with this? When she says, I want a course on X, and here are the slides I made about it, what do we say that keeps her happily engaged? <laughs> yes? Thank you. Um, I'm sure we can use those in due course, but let's have a conversation. Thank you. I'm sh thank you. I would, he, you say, I, I'm sure we can use those. I would say, thank you. These will be helpful. What will they be helpful for? Understanding the problem. <laughs> Thank you so much for these slides that you've created. They will help me understand the problem. How do we respond to the first bit where she says, people are doing Y and Z, which is wrong? How do you know? <laughs> that might be a little strong. <laughs> what are you seeing that, 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 that shows you that they're doing this? Why are they doing it? I like, I like why. I'm sorry? What are the consequences of them doing it wrong? I, I really am fond of the word why, as you're about to see. So I would probably stick with that. So in response to the content, thank you. This will help me understand the issues. So the main problem is that people are doing Y and Z. Why? Why are they doing that? We want to know how has she analyzed the problem? How much analysis has she done? She says, some of them don't know any better. Others know but don't care, so they need a course with motivational parts. I think it should have feature A, talking poodle or whatever it is. So let's do this in two parts again. How do we respond to the last bit she said, I think it should have feature A? We're being agreeable, but not agreeing. What is it that feature A would change? I'm sorry? What is it that feature A would change? What would feature A change? What would we get from feature A? What else? We could have a look at that. We, could have a look at that. we not I, we could consider that. How could A resolve the challenge? I'm, I am very concerned about seeming to resist what she's saying at this point. So I, I like the total marshmallow approach of, yeah, that's certainly something we could consider. And then immediately distract <laughs> with, <laughs> with what? Some of them don't know any better. She has analyzed the problem. Some of them don't know any better. Others know but don't care. Let's ask some more questions. Feature A is certainly something we can consider. We can consider it. We are collaborating. I am not following orders. First, I need to make sure I understand the problem you're seeing. Prepare for more questions. We are being what I call a relentless marshmallow. Imagine a slightly stale marshmallow. <laughs> You poke it and it is soft and it gives only to a certain degree. Stop poking it and it goes back. It seems so friendly and so helpful. It never really disagrees, but it also does not agree. It is trying to help you. It wants the best for you. And I think a lot of us are having to lead from below. Our L&D director type people are maybe not setting the image of the department as I think it maybe should be, we are the course factory. And you have to say, no, we're not. So we're leading from below with this sort of marshmallow approach. We are happy and helpful. Thank you. We're so polite. We like the stuff that you have done. We are certainly willing to consider the things you propose. We are going to consider it, you and me. However, all I want to talk about is the problem, problem, problem. I just keep distracting you with questions about the problem. These words, the forbidden words, have not left our lips. The client keeps saying them, and we keep dodging them. We also are not trying to sell ourselves at this point. This is a tricky one for the external providers. Sure, I can do that. I know what tool to use in everything. We're not saying any of that because there is no course. There is only a problem which we are about to clarify quickly so we can 
first make sure that there may actually be a training element to this and also so we can prepare for the analysis meeting. An example, they say, we need a course on ethics. That is not enough information to help me prepare for analyzing their problem or even confirming that there's a training issue. We have another example, we need a course on bedside manner. We need a little more from the client on that. And I do it with the word why, as I've been saying. You've all heard about the five whys. Here's an example from my, my work. There was a company with stores all over the US. They came to me and said, our store managers need ethics training. Make us some ethics training. And I did not say what type or when. I said, why do they need ethics training? They're falsifying their performance reports. They're making their stores look better than they are. Next question. Why? <laughs> why are they doing this? <laughs> They can't meet their quotas, so they lie to avoid looking bad. Next question. Why? There's two questions here we could ask. We could ask, why do they lie? That, however, gets us back to the beginning of, oh, they lie because they need ethics training. The better question is, why can't they meet their quotas? The answer, the quotas are challenging, and their managers won't help them. Again, we have the option of two questions. We could say, why are the quotas challenging? Or we could go for the juicy one. Why don't the managers help? We have a macho culture. So managers say things like, just get it done and don't be a wuss. This is a direct quote, actually. <laughs> so my question, we started out, they came to us saying, help us make ethics training. And in literally, it was a little longer time than this, but several minutes of a few whys, and it became clear to the client, I didn't have to say anything. If training is part of the solution here, who should receive it? Managers, the bosses. What might be the focus? How to, how to be a more helpful boss. The client saw this on their own. All I had to do was ask, Clueless outsider questions. There's no advising or anything. It's just me asking questions and they go, oh. So that's what we need to do in the handoff. It goes very quickly. Why? Why do we need a course on ethics? The answer, our sales reps recently started working in Zekostan, where it's common to give gifts that could be misinterpreted as bribes. They're afraid of offending people, so they accept gifts that could get us into trouble. Is this ethics training? What do you think? What, what, if, if training is part of the solution, what might it actually address? Cultural differences, cross-cultural communication. Basically, how to politely decline a gift in Zekostan while maintaining the relationship with the prospect. Super specific, it's not ethics training. Ethics training is don't lie, follow the rules. They need a course on bedside manner, they say, and you say, why? The residents of our elder care home complain that the nurses don't listen to them or act like they care. The nurses just do the minimum. Are you willing to jump ahead and make training about how to be a nice nurse? Or what? What, what's, what might be happening here? Why, do they need the Why are they doing the minimum? What, what possible reasons could there be? Understaffed, don't have enough time. The supplies they need are in some remote place. They don't have enough of whatever it is they need. The client assumed training, we have to protect both the client and the organization, the people who are writing our checks, to make sure that we're actually solving the real problem. So in our marshmallow questions, we've gotten the client to see a couple of things. We are very interested in helping them. We are not challenging in the least. We are easy to talk to. We ask these outsider questions that make the client you know, see their problem a little more clearly. Ideally, she is then going to be willing to commit to at least a two hour meeting at a future date, like maybe day after tomorrow, in which you are going to continue to ask these outsider questions. And she's prepared for that. That is the ideal. Some people have to push for just 
one hour. Get what you can, and we'll talk about, in that meeting, I need to have this meeting to help me understand the problem, play the outsider, to make sure I understand what you need, because it is all about you, client. I want to make you look good. We've never said this. <laughs> and that is such a trick, too. I want to, um, what time is it? We're at half past four. OK. I want to quickly take a look at more specific things we could do here. We talked about some things the client, whoa, some things the client will say and how we could possibly respond. There's a couple of examples here. The client says, for example, we don't have to have an analysis meeting. I've already done it. And I've suggested as a possible response, I am the outsider. Help me understand. Help me understand. You can play really dumb. I've played really dumb with a lot of people. We have a client who is actually the minion. They don't really feel the pain. They've been told have a course made. And this is from somebody in one of my workshops. This is a great thing to say, he says. To make sure, I need to, to make sure I get a full picture from different levels in the organization. Can I check in with your manager to run over some questions? This is how, if we've got the wrong client, we can, in a politically savvy way, maybe find the right one. So anybody else want to suggest something they hear from a, a client at this stage that they don't know how to respond to? Yes. Let me put it in the table here because I love this one. Legally, we have to cover this thing. Whoopsies. Oh, don't look it up, please, word. Legally, we have to cover whatever. How can we respond? Legally, we have to cover the alien leaf policy. They have to be exposed to every page of it. Can, how can we respond to that? What are some ideas? I'm sorry? Could you, could you? Yeah, what are the implications of not doing this? Actually, basically, why? <laughs> why, why is this? Um, what are the implications? And I would ask, um, too, who, who is this coming from? Is this really a clear edict from legal that we cannot possibly discuss? Or is it just some vague misunderstanding? Because I think a lot of the time, when I hear we have to cover this, if you ask why, who is saying that? It's maybe somebody, some subject matter expert, because it's their pet content. It's not really an edict. And any, any other ways to respond to this? Because this is a tricky one. Yeah. Could we say what would happen if we didn't? What would happen if we didn't? Let's rebel. <laughs> didn't. Exactly. Does it state exactly how it must be delivered? Because maybe we could just have them, I mean, I've seen situations in which they just have to read a one-page form saying, you know, I have read and understood the blah, blah, blah signed. It's not, I have personally been exposed to page 12. <laughs> any, any other reactions to this one? Yeah. How are we going to measure whether they've been exposed? We start getting kind of tactical there, and there's, I have a concern about getting tactical in that. She says, well, then you can put it in the LMS, and I know that it tracks this and that, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> any, any other um, challenging st statements that <laughs> you get from people um, that you want to practice responding to? Any, what's another challenge? Yeah. We need something innovative and cool. It has to be cool. <laughs> Fun, engaging, <laughs> motivational, too. <laughs> OK, we, it has to be 
We need something fun, motivating, innovative. I will put in innovative. In. What can we say in our um, relentless marshmallow way to sound agreeable without agreeing to a specific tactic? What did we say before? Yes, this is certainly something we will consider. It's always our goal to make engaging learning experiences. There are so many ways we could do that. In fact, the way you're picturing might not be <laughs> one of them. But yeah, we say this, yes, we, yeah, we'll certainly aim for that. There are a lot of ways. <laughs> without going into specifics, because it's not time to go into specifics. And this is the big thing. It's, we're so used to talking tactically. We're so used to getting sucked into the, oh, drag and drop. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, a webinar is more fun than a, no. <laughs> because we haven't confirmed yet whether training is even the solution. So it's always something that, oh, we will certainly keep that in mind. And as we get closer to designing the solution, we will look at different ways we could do that. Something like that. We aren't there yet. Yes? I was just going to say, I think that often the clients try to design the solution for you before you've even had it. So things like, um, oh, I want it to have this in it, and then, and then this happens. And, yeah. And it's like you have to keep, right? That's really difficult because they've just cleared off the damn as well the path that you're not ready for. What do we do when the client is designing it for you? Like one that she says, it has to have feature A, and then when they do this, it does this, and then, you know, and I saw this one course where they had this. Yeah. I want that. Or everybody really liked the thing that had a game show. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, I would do the marshmallow thing saying, that is certainly something we could consider. Or even, I like those too. So tell me more about the problem. <laughs> tell me more about the problem, because I refuse to commit to anything at this point. Any, any other challenging statements we hear from people? Yeah, when they just want to raise awareness. Oh, the awareness one. <laughs> they just need to be aware. What can we say to keep them focused on the problem? Why? What will be different when they are aware? How can we tell looking at Bob that he is aware and Mary is not? So variations on why. Yeah, what, basically what will change when they, what will change when they are aware? Because that tells us what the problem is. They need to be aware of the alien leave policy. Why? because we're getting sued for not applying it correctly. Oh, okay, that gets us closer to the problem. So let me um, get back to what we're on here. Where's my controller? <laughs> Too many gadgets. So through all of this in the handoff discussion, we are focused entirely on not talking about a solution, talking instead about the problem. We are going to get them to agree to this kickoff meeting. A couple of things that we, three things obviously that we need to do, send the agenda, and two things that were not included in instructional design school. Some, do some independent research. Very quickly on the agenda, again, we're setting the goal as I must understand the thing, and we personally directly send it to the subject matter experts, because if we send it to the client and they forward it to them, what do they say when they forward it? Here's the meeting where we talk about the course. It's a project. <laughs> Two things we want to research before this meeting. What could we possibly measure about what we understand the problem to be at this point? Google. It's so handy. They, they, they've described something that maybe, like, maybe we could measure, you know, there's unhappiness, there's negativity, maybe we could measure employee, I don't know, satisfaction, engagement. We learn about these different measures quickly. We don't get too deep into them yet because we haven't even analyzed the problem. 
Our patients are unhappy, they're complaining. What do people normally measure? It looks like there's something called patient satisfaction, patient experience, we might poke around in there. And we're doing this because in the analysis meeting, we're gonna ask the client, what are we gonna to measure to know that we've succeeded? And the client might say, what? <laughs> and you can say, well, I found that many organizations <laughs> measure X in case they draw a blank because you are there to make them look good. Research possible solutions. If you've gotten enough information about the problem, like we had the, the nursing one, let's say that we got enough information about the problem that it does seem to be, you know, something happening with the nurses, we can say, improve patient satisfaction. Look at this, we've got one, a caring model to improve patient satisfaction that seems to have maybe something to do with making patients feel more cared for. How Cleveland Clinic improved patient satisfaction with data. We like these things because a lot of clients think that their problem is so unique that we must create a custom solution for everyone. And maybe we will discover that their problem is actually kind of common <laughs> and there are some solutions that we could maybe follow that are already out there. Again, this is all very quick research because we haven't gotten into the analysis yet. And while you're doing this, the client is preparing to talk about what the course should cover. In the meeting, very quickly, you know how to do this. Take charge, which means not only you know, take the power position and everything, but start off the meeting in a way that says, I'm in charge, not you, client. Thanks for coming, I'm excited to be in a project about X. We could have a real impact or something that you can genuinely say with genuine enthusiasm about not I'm looking forward to making a fun course, but I'm looking forward to making you look good. The goal of this meeting is to help me understand, not for me to question every statement you make and show you how you're wrong, to help me understand. Get them to decide on a measurement. We talked about the goal earlier. We're going to do this to make sure they focus on the problem and its solution. We want to justify not even the expense of the project, the existence. Why does this thing deserve to exist? and to evaluate the solution later. I have a template, and you have a handout actually that has this in it, so I don't need to talk about this in great depth, but basically to fill out that template and to get them from an information dump focus to actually analyzing the problem, we ask a few questions again. Here's the template. They want us, they want, Training on managing sensitive issues in teams. And we say, what are we currently measuring? Employee engagement is one thing we're measuring. Okay, let's go with that. And if they're afraid of this, we can say we can contribute to an increase in employee engagement. How much should it change and by when? They get really nervous with this. But again, we say, we're gonna just contribute to this. We're not gonna claim that we have done this, but we want a reasonable measure. Who needs to change and what in general should they do? Let's focus on our audience. Let's make sure that the audience is specific enough, not everyone in the organization. Team leaders need to apply this issue model that the client found. Okay, fine, that's good to start with. And this is the one that, where we get tripped up because of our instructional design training. List what people need to do. The internet tells me that these are good learning objectives. Explain this thing, identify this other thing, list some stuff and define something or discuss. These are not things that happen on the job. They happen on a test. They're considered observable because you can have somebody do it on a test and you could observe them writing it. This is what we want. Make complex decisions in a complex situation. So here's Jorge's boss. Here's what she needs to do, this is the goal. Violations of the alien leave policy will decrease a certain amount. And here are some things I say she needs to do. Offer the correct type of leave, offer the correct amount of leave. Don't do a few things. People have issues with negative statements, I think they're fine. Don't tell leave takers to work from home, which was what was happening with Jorge. 
we apparently have some issues here. Managers appear to punish staff for requesting leave, maybe because of these issues about do aliens really deserve to whatever. Respond non-judgmentally. <laughs> what do these statements have in common? What, what kind of statements are they? They're active. Are they phantom statements that only happen in an imaginary world? <laughs> I'd say that these are truly observable. We can have some, we can videotape her making a decision about alien leave and we can say, look, she has done these things and she hasn't done these other things. They are super observable. They describe what she does on the job. They will lead us to our goal. Here's some that are very common. Be aware of the types of leave and understand the importance of leave. Not observable, there is no action. But here's some that are actually supposedly observable. Define alien. Of course she needs to be able to define alien, right? And describe the unique needs of aliens. She needs to be able to do that in order to truly understand why we need the policy. Why don't I like these? I'm sorry? They're not behaviors. We have gotten into her head. We're making assumptions about things. This, uh, these are what I would call enabling objectives. They are the knowledge and attitudes that she needs to make good decisions, but we are not there yet because we're just analyzing what needs to happen and finding out why it isn't happening. So this is how we would normally write these objectives. Offer the correct type of leave. This is one thing that she's supposed to do. I was trained to break that down into all the sub-objectives and enabling objectives. And so I could really go to town on this until we're ending up into, you know, explain employee satisfaction, define medically necessary, describe this. We need to erase this from our heads because those are all test objectives. Instead, what we need to get more detailed about is what do they need to do. The major action has sub-actions. Correct type of leave for each situation. Offer X leave in situation X. <laughs> Offer Y leave in situation Y. And as we talk with the subject matter expert, they say, you know, situation Y is tricky. There are these other things they also have to do. Ask for a doctor's note, securely store it. If you suspect whatever, notify Alien Protective Services. That's tricky and gets broken down into some other things that we need to do. So instead of running off into all this knowledge, we're getting deep into what they need to do, and we run it all through a, let me go there, we run it through a flowchart that is available on my site that helps the client identify, are there issues in the environment? Are there problems with tools? Are there basically non-training solutions to this problem? So that is what we do. We focus on this, keep distracting them with the problem, help them see for themselves through this analysis discussion that there are many possible solutions. Avoid the forbidden words at all times, even in this two-hour analysis discussion. It's a great experiment. Focus them on the problem. And this is one of the benefits which I will not talk about because I want to get us to talk about this. We want, as designers, to solve the actual performance problem. There are various job behaviors that will help us get to that goal, and we've just looked at a lot of them. Which one are you going to do differently? This is our bridge. Does anybody want to share with the group? Anything, any takeaway you've got that you're going to take back to your workplace? Or how about you talk among yourselves? <laughs> and then maybe I will prod you. So please, and either turn to your neighbor or turn to your table. And if there is anything among this that, that is actually a takeaway for you, and speaking of takeaways, there is your handout. So when you have a chance, take a photo of this. And the handout has the key slides, including all of those say these words, don't say that. <coughs> but please um, consider 
what is it that you're going to do differently as a result of what we just went through today? So I quite like, I quite like the idea, actually, of, um, of getting through a client meeting with, without using the forbidden words. Yeah, a couple of hours with a client and trying not to say LMS, course, et cetera, et cetera. Because we've all been there, right? We've all, we've all recognized parts of that in our career. How many of us were sitting through you know, this fantastic insight from Cathy thinking, yeah, done that, yeah, done that. <laughs> Yeah, that person came to me and said that. I can remember, I can remember somebody. And I guess one of my observations is, I just wish I'd sat through this 10 years ago at the yes. beginning of my own new career. It would have made life an awful lot easier. And if they get anything that they want to share in terms of what they're going to do. Yes. We've got one here. I'll try and stop disagreeing with our clients. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know they shouldn't be doing stuff, but it doesn't really help when I say so. <laughs> so he's saying start, he's going to stop disagreeing. So you've been like so, sort of saying, I don't think you really want to do that, sort of. I think one of the things that happens, like, we're trying to get into a more performance consulting role, and a lot of people think consultants provide advice. Oh, consultants ask questions so the client sees for themselves. There's a several good books on consulting. One that came up earlier is Flawless Consulting. There's another one that I unfortunately can't remember the title of that's all about asking good questions. Um, so if you want to read more on, on consulting, a consulting mindset, how to manage clients, there's several good books out there, none of them in our niche. There is a book called Performance Consulting, but it's, um, I think it's still maybe a little more directive than I think we should be as marshmallows. Um, can I ask a favor? Um, if there's something that you've thought of, something when you leave today and you think, actually, that's going to be my bridge, can you go into Twitter, hashtag LT19UK, and share it? Because there are three other, four other tracks going on at exactly the same time as this. And it would be great if we can share some of the insight that we've, we've gathered from, from this session today. Um, can I ask uh, any questions for Cathy just before we wrap up? <laughs> yeah, we've got one here. Thank you so much, Cathy. Um, it was really, really helpful what you covered. I'd like to ask for some advice of, on how you could approach this in some very hierarchical structures, where the person in, in charge of these kinds of conversations doesn't necessarily have the authority. There are lots of people above you, um, so you don't always have the flexibility to be doing the right yeah. thing. How do, how do we handle this in a very hierarchical organization? Any, any ideas on that? We had a suggestion earlier of help me understand this issue and for me to understand this issue. I'm, I really need to talk to people at several levels so I get a complete picture. So that way you're going over their head, but you're doing it in a way that is because I am so ignorant. I have to do this. <laughs> yeah. go down the course route and that's not really the, what's needed, you're wasting so, you could put that into monetary terms or target terms or whatever. So maybe we put it into monetary terms, the, the expense of going down the, the usual course path. Yeah. There's also, if, if you can get someone like your boss to say, here is this new procedure we use, you can, you can blame it on the procedure. Oh, we've changed our procedure for this. <laughs> And in step one, I'm going to ask you all these questions. <laughs> yes. I work in a very hierarchical organization. And what I find is trying to find out who ultimately is going to sign off at the end of this is a success to say that they have to agree the problem. They don't have to be involved in it that mm -hmm. much, but they have to say that's the right problem at the beginning. Find the person with the signature power, and then you, you go to them somehow. Or... Other people go to them, make a document. We have a okay. document that says, what's the picture of success? Uh huh. Yeah. And they have to agree. So they have to agree to the, 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 the goal, the view of success. There's also, if you look at, um, if you get an ideas from sales, there's a type of 
complex sales, if you've written sales courses, you've probably written about this, where you go in, you're trying to sell your software to a big organization, you find the influencers, you find the decision makers, you find the check writers. And you approach them differently depending on where they are. And so if we can get an awareness of the organization at that level, that might help. Yeah. I, I think that sometimes you also need to accept that, because I'm in a hierarchical, hierarchical organization as well, that sometimes you need to start with a solution that you know is not ideal and then continue to build a relationship with all those important stakeholders and then slowly start to nudge them in yeah. the right direction. A lot of what we're doing is you're ideally, especially for those of you inside organizations, you're going to see that client again. So the way you talk to them this time, you're sort of training them. This is how we interact. And they, ideally, they see the benefit. So when they come to you again, they're less about the course and more about the problem. We've got one last question down at the front here. Hi, Kathy. Um, I worked with a client recently where we've, we've, I've sort of gone through this process, and I think it's been relatively successful. I think I've kind of clawed the back from the information dump. Um, but what they're doing now is contacting me saying, can we add this slide into, <laughs> because we've now got this other thing we want. So they're kind of, they're like editing it after the fact. So we've gone through a really nice design process with something that's actually a finished thing. And now they're trying to sort of, now they're doing the kind of, it's a bit sneaky. There's yeah. all the information dumping after the fact because we now need to add this. I suppose, do you need to then go through the whole process again? Or I don't know like how to kind of, push back on the emails that they're sending me, which are just like essays worth of additional text. <clears throat> the um, scope yeah. of the project that we defined <laughs> was X. That's what you can do as an external person. You say, that, that's out of scope, I'm sorry. Um, eh. Internally, like you make these great, plunge them into the activity, decision-making activities, and then they say, oh, and now we need the knowledge assessment, you know, or something like that that you know is not necessary. Or they say, we need to cover you know, the, the addendum to the alien leave policy in these 12 text-heavy slides. Put them in. Uh, yeah, any, any suggestions on how to do that? I mean, I, I really think that we teach people how to treat us. And so if we say, OK, we're teaching them that that's OK. So we do have to resist in some way just to make sure they understand that this is not a good idea. But we may have to give in depending on situations. Yeah. Yeah, you take them back, she's saying you take them back to the beginning saying, in what way is this information useful? What is the behavior, the part of the goal that exposing them to this information will achieve? And also I think that's the time to then push back. So actually then because you've demonstrated your capability, um, actually then you can say what's the flip side of this? What does it achieve if we end up switching to a Yeah, and what are the possible drawbacks of this now that they've had this cool thing that we've designed and now you, they're having to click through these 12 text-heavy slides, they are going to be turned off. Is that what we want? Yeah. Yeah. You have to tell very carefully, though, because sometimes it's their content and then yeah. you out of it and then you kind of click Yeah. It's really, and you know how you can go in the file properties and see who created the file? Do that. <laughs> when they give you 187 slides, who created it? And when you meet them, oh, those were such useful slides. Unfortunately, not one of them is going to see the light of day, but <laughs> it's nice. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, everyone, could you give a round of applause for a fantastic session from Kathy? <laughs>